the, uh, the global idea for this uh, brief presentation is to give you, um, how should I say, a little bit of flavor of what we've recently been doing in the lab. Uh, I mean, we do a lot of different things, but one of the topic is still dioxin, PCBs, and, and those type of compounds. And we always try to go faster and better under ISO 17025, of course, because we do a lot of food and feed control uh, in our lab in Belgium under the uh, EU legislation. But we also do a lot of uh, human biomonitoring. So we develop methods also for uh, serum sample analysis for mainly dioxin and PCB, because those are the, the usual suspect, but you know, the BFRs, all those compounds are there as well. So um, this is going to be, let's say, in two major parts. The first part is going to be uh, dedicated to, let's say, sample preparation, and then we'll move a bit more in the mass spec direction. And I have to say that, uh, I'm going to say, I was going to say most of the work, but not all the work that I'm going to present to you has been uh, uh, carried out by uh, Chiara Kalapritch, who uh, is currently doing some postdoc in the UK. Um, that's not the scope, but this is, you know, this sort of wheel there is what we have to deal with when we consider doing dioxin measurement. Um, Many people know about dioxin, many labs do, let's say, pesticides, for example, but we have to realize that doing pesticides is not like doing dioxins. It's two different worlds. Uh, that, that's, you know, mainly because of the levels, of course, we are chasing very, very low level. We are talking about femtogram, low femtogram levels of compounds when you look to food and feed. Uh, but every time we're going to have to either say, okay, I'm going to go for manual sample prep or automated sample prep, because you will have to go through sample prep. You cannot say, oh, I'm going to do, you know, take my meat sample or my serum sample, just, you know, push it in a little micro syringe and inject that to my GC. I mean, you can try, but I will not go too far in the, in the GC column, hopefully. Um, then you have to do, you know, sample prep, you have to fractionate, uh, because I was saying that we do like to look at dioxin, furans, PCB, so it's a lot of compounds. So even if you look to biological sample, where we, you do have the biological filtration, so in terms of dioxin, for example, it's mainly only the 2378 uh, type congener that will be there, but still it's enough congener to put your GC in trouble. So it's most of the time people are, will go fractionation for fractionation, like you're going to get like a dioxin fraction and a PCB fraction. That will make your life a bit easier. Uh, of course, you have to do two GC injection, but I mean, we will see that there are some uh, solutions to, to save some time. You have to be careful on the sorbent that you're going to use. You can use uh, size exclusion chromatography. You can use silica for acidic digestion. You can use uh, alumina. You can use carbon. You can use you know fluorizyl. It's a lot of different type of sorbent that are available. You have to build up your own uh, recipe. I would say depending how you want to fractionate your sample. Uh, solvents. I'm just putting that because it's wet chromatography. So you have to, if you want to do sample preparation, we have to use solvent to go through. This is the mobile phase to the stationary phase of your solvent, basically. So most of the time, when you talk about dioxin, you're talking about, I was going to say milliliter, but lots, I mean, thousands of milliliters, so which means liters of solvent. And that's a big, big deal, of course, because you, know, you don't want to create too much waste by just doing the measurement of some toxic compounds. You have to find the balance. So that's where a lot of people are focusing their attention to try to reduce the quantity of solvent that, that is required to uh, do the sample preparation properly. But again, if you have to analyze, a 100 gram piece of meat, I mean, you will need some solvent at some point. So that's, you know, it's because the levels are low. If you can work on you know, ma one microgram of meat, then you, you use much less solvent. But because of the low level, we have to use some solvent. As I said, fractionation to get different um, fraction for the analysis. And then, of course, you need to develop your method. And method, I mean, we are mainly talking today and tomorrow about the, the sector instrument. There's a few other alternatives, but still the gold standard remains. Uh, the, uh, the sector instrument, which is uh, presented there. Uh, I'm just showing that because it's going to be a couple of talks about dual uh, data acquisition. I'm going to just touch it to introduce it so that the next you know, few speakers can uh, develop that. But that's, that's something very interesting to, to use. So let's say the first part is for sample prep. Um, if you talk about food and feed, um, food is quite, uh, let's say, normalized. It's meat, eggs, milk, you know, this is what we know what we eat, right? We, this is quite a limited number of items. Uh, feed, it's much, much larger. I mean, we, what we give to the animals to grow is, can be anything. So that's much more complex to develop method for feed than for food because it could be any type of additives, uh, you know, oils, mineral oils, and you know, so that has to be very versatile. DA, so the, the, the PLE, is one of the way to, uh, to go for the extraction because, of course, the first step will always be extraction. Let's get the, the full matrix and let's 
just get rid of what we are not interested in and focus on the lipophilic compounds because our molecules are lipophilic. Then we have to go, you know, either for, as I said, PLE or can also do some liquid liquid extraction. If you are a chemist, you've been doing liquid liquid extraction and it's not always fun, right? Sometimes it's big volumes to shake, sometimes you don't have good phase separation, but then sometimes it's still the best way to do things. Like Soxlet extraction. Soxlet is quite old, but still we do a lot of Soxlet in the lab because it's a very efficient technique. We use quite a lot of solvent though, but you know, that's sometimes things have to be like this. When we move to more like liquid low fat uh, compounds, solid phase micro, oh, uh, not solid phase micro extraction, solid phase extraction, uh, SPE can, can be used, C18 or different type of hydrometrics can be used to extract your compounds. Of course, you're not going to put a piece of meat in there, so it has to be liquid or you have to pre-digest the meat, but it becomes to be uh, a bit more complex. So this is working very well for blood. Method for dioxin in blood have been used uh, at CDC in Atlanta for the last 25, probably 30 years now. So this is working very well. And then once, this is only for the extraction, and once it's extracted, you need to polish up the sample to clean up the sample and to fractionate the sample. That's where most of the time automated systems are used, where you have multi-layer, uh, multi-step based on multi uh, or different solvent that can be used uh, on an automated way. I'm going to develop that a little bit uh, in this presentation. The title is important, low solvent DCM free. Uh, as I said, we want to reduce the quantity of solvent that we use and obviously if we can get rid of the use of chlorinated solvent, that's good. So that has been one of the driving force for the last few years because for those of you that are familiar with the, the, let's say the power prep or the old generation of power prep, uh, quite a significant amount of dichloromethane was used. So we've been trying to uh, readjust a little bit the method to try to get rid of the DCM uh, and, and, and that's, that's working now. So this is based on the use of, of this uh, interesting uh, piece of equipment which is uh, named the Econoprep uh, where basically if you look to the, 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 the sequence of the sorbonne, so you've got a, a silica, can be a multilayer silica column, acidic silica for fat digestion, basic silica for removing some degradation products, then you move to the fractionation step where most of the time carbon columns or dispersed carbon column and alumina, basic alumina column are used. It used to be for many, many years, and it is based from Smith and Stalin publication back in the 80s, so that's quite a, a long time that has been running. Most of the time, silica was used, then alumina, and then carbon. And in this, in this sequence, it's, it's a bit different because we still use the silica for fat digestion, but then we, we let's say, reshuffle a little bit things and then we go to carbon first and then the alumina in the second uh, position. What's happening is that you load your sample there and as you say, the two solvents that we use are only hexane and toluene. There is no DCM anymore there. That's why we have to change the column order. And you go, you go with your extract there, so you've got your lipid degradation. This is in hexane media. You go through the carbon column and what's going to happen when you go through the carbon column, the planar molecule will be trapped there. This is the idea of using this carbon column. So let's say the dioxin, the furans, and the coplanar PCBs will remain on the carbon column. We are in hexane. Then you keep, you know, continuing the, 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 the travel of the, of the hexane, and you go to the alumina column, where the other PCB will be trapped there. And then this goes, of course, to waste because there is nothing interesting there except degradation product. So this is the, the, the polishing up of your sample. And then in the next step, you're just going to have to do a back flush of the carbon column. You will collect your, your so-called dioxin fraction with the coplanar species, including the coplanar PCBs. You evaporate that and you go to the GCM spec. And then you can also uh, here use the, uh, the back flush again with toluene. You back flush the, uh, the alumina column and you've got your uh, non-planar species. <laughs> and that's, that's a very simple way to, uh, to fractionate and it doesn't require dichloromethane anymore, which was used uh, before. Um, this is the, the scheme of the, um, let's say, the, the valves and everything. So just to show you that it's, it's a, the design is as simple as before. I mean, it's just like three-way valves and six-way valves. And it's not even a six-way valve, no, because you just use two different types of solvents. So even that is simplified. Uh, but you pick up your solvent, you've got your, your pump to get your solvent or your sample through the uh, silica, carbon, and alumina. And you need a waste to, uh, to collect the, uh, the solvent. Um, it's something to to notice is that the, the composition of this carbon column is a bit different from the, what was what used to be on the normal design of the old power prep system, I would say. If you want more detail, just talk to FMS, but the, the, dis the dispersion of those uh, 0.34 grams of carbon is a bit different. Um, so you cannot really use, let's say, the old column to do this new approach. I mean, be careful on which carbon column you use. 
Also, uh, you can, and that's the big idea, you can accommodate the size of your silica colon, which is responsible of the fat digestion. You can accommodate that to the type of sample you run. Because if you run a serum sample, if you work on, let's say, 20 milliliter or 10 milliliter of serum sample, the human serum is 0.5 percent fat, depending how is your cholesterol level, of course. But you know, it's more or less like half a percent fat. And if you take a piece of meat, that can be like 35, 40, 50 percent fat. So it's different uh, fat amounts. So you need different capacity in terms of fat digestion. So you just adjust the size of the silica column. And I will come back to that uh, a bit later, because we have different ways to do that. Uh, yeah, we can already start to talk about that now. But this is the, the first column. This is the second column. This is the third column. And as I say, the, let's say the second part here, so that's the fat di digestion I was talking about. The second part is for the fractionation. You understood from what I said, this is where you're really going to split your sample in two parts. If you do not want to split, that's OK. You just collect the same the two fractions in the same vial, and you do you know, a big GC column or GC times GC you know, with the mass spec deconvolution. You can do that if you want. But if you want to use a sector instrument, it's much better to, to get your two, uh, your two fractions. And this is just a few examples. That's not an exhaustive list, but this is what you can get in terms of different sizes of the silica column I was just mentioning. If you want to do serum sample, you take this one. This is just a, a I was going to say tiny, but it could even be smaller. And we are pushing FMS to have even smaller column. But this is just six gram uh, acidic silica. This is enough when you do blood sample, human or even from animals. You do the blood, you do solid phase extraction, you concentrate, so you're in hexane, and you can load that to the six gram silica column, and that's enough for the degradation. So, of course, the smaller the column, the smaller is the volume of solvent that you use, right? So that, that is why we want to decrease the size of the column. The bigger one, the, the Excel uh, ABN column, can accumulate you know, higher amount of fat. I'm mentioning five gram here. If you ask FMS, they would probably tell you that it can even go higher. But let's say that this is the safe number. If you don't go over five gram, you will never have problem. Because it's going to be OK for eight gram of pork fat, but it will not be OK for eight gram of egg yolk. You know, it, it really depends. So that's why it's a conservative number, but you can have different numbers from FMS if you want. So basically, depending on your need, you just can scale down the, uh, the silica column. And this is uh, the example for serum sample. If you take like the small column I was just mentioning, six gram, you have the, the same type of fractionation, and then this is what you're going to need. You're going to need 110 milliliter of total volume of solvent, including toluene and hexane, and it's going to take 20 minutes. It's not too bad. I mean, if you do human biomonitoring, thousands of samples, and you have to spend 20 minutes per sample, that, that's, I think it's, it's OK. I would prefer 5, but 20 is better than 45. That's the way I see it. And 110 milliliter is still, if you talk to a we do a proteomics and metabolomics in my lab as well. And when I talk to my colleagues, oh, yeah, we are very happy because we scaled down to 110 milliliters of solvent for sample preparation. Those guys use like microliter of volumes uh, in terms of solvent. So they say, you're crazy. But they don't know exactly what we do. So they are, they are maybe the ones that are crazy. Um, one thing I want to highlight, and that thing for me, that's the key point. If you just have to take one message back home, that's this one. Independently of the fat content that you're going to have, this second part of the preparation, so the, the fractionation part, can be the same. <coughs> if you think in terms of ISO 17025, you do have to validate for accreditation uh, issues. It's easier to have like a, a generic method that can slightly be adjusted than to have all time different methods. So that's what we really like with this, is that this fractionation part is going to be always the same. So if you have to validate for feed, for food, or for human serum, the second part is going to be validated once, and that's it. You're just going to have to work on this part, for depending on the matrices. Yeah, that's just if you split in detail. So that's, that's the, the, the volume I just mentioned and the time I mentioned. This is the, the volume of the different steps. So you, as you can see, you know, this is for the, the elution of the, of the carbon and the alumina, like 25 milliliters uh, is enough. Of course, you know, you know, the 20 milliliters for the, this is for the conditioning of the system. And then you have the, what we call the silica elution, 40 milliliters. Uh, of hexane, this is going to be more, the higher is the column, the, the higher is going to be the volume, of course, right? That's, that's obvious. Um, this is just a quick comparison. We, we do have a serum method running in the lab that, that has been accredited probably 10 years ago now. And then when I talk to my routine people, they never want to change anything because they say, it takes too much time and blah, 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 blah. So I don't care. I, I keep developing methods. They don't use them. <laughs> but I, I'm a motivated scientist. So, um, so if they would, they could do a lot of saving in the routine lab. They don't want to, it seems. 
although they always complain that you know we are receiving pallets of solvents every week, pallets. So they could save a bit of solvent. I'm not going to go in detail to the number, but this year we save 100 percent. So we could remove the, the delivery of dichloromethane in the lab if we want. They don't want. I don't care. Um, Chiara did a lot of also. She went really uh, in details in the fractionation process. Uh, she she wanted to be sure that you know when you go to the carbon column with the when you flush the in forward direction the carbon column with hexane. She wanted to be absolutely sure. She's really picky. Absolutely sure that none of the uh, planar species would go through. She wanted to be sure that this is a fully efficient trap. So she did a lot of elution profile. Again, I'm not going to go in all details, but she, she can tell you if you ask her, is it your method really working? I mean, be careful if you ask that to her, because she's <laughs> going to say, yeah, sure. And she's going to pop up all those numbers. And trust me, I've been looking to all those data. And this is, we can really say that the way the fractionation goes, it's efficient. You are targeting, you know, we are following the EU legislation, which is a very strict legislation for food and feed. So in terms of recovery rates and all those parameters which are for QAQC, uh, we are uh, in, in, in line with that. Uh, this is for food and feed, so that's exactly the same scheme, except that this is a bigger column. The bigger column, then you have you know, more volumes and it takes a bit more time. That's the price to pay. That's nothing I can say uh, on that. And then this is, again, the split of the different consumption, and we end up, let's say, at 300 milliliter and let's say 35 minutes. So it's, it's more solvent, yes, for sure. And we are working to try to reduce that. But as I said, when you have to process 100 grams of meat, I mean, if you can go through lyophilization if you want. You can do everything you want, but the fat is still going to be there, and you're going to get, to, you're going to have to get rid of the fat. You might say, why don't you do GPC or size exclusion chromatography instead of lipid degradation? I mean, we've been doing that in the past, but my, I always prefer to go for lipid digestion than lipid removal because I think it's more efficient. But it's it's open to discussion. Uh, this one is uh, again for, for food and feed, based on the different size of the column, so based on the different amount of fat. So this is for two, 2.5 gram, or you know, when it's veg vegetable oil, it's a bit less because the fat is not the same. When we say fat, it's you know, it, it's made of different molecules, right? So depending on the combination of the molecule, the cleanup might be more or less efficient. So it, it depends uh, on that. So that's a little bit less volume. This is if you just go to one gram of fat, uh, because you might want to do a pre-fat digestion. Why not? That's something I like to do in the lab, is to say, oh, I've got like a 10 gram sample fat. So I've got 10 gram of fat. So if I use the scaling I'm mentioning, I'm going to have to use a big silica column, right? I'm going to use a lot of solvent. So I, what I could do is a quick and dirty fat digestion. I can just put the fat, pour like hydrochloric acid on the fat, shake it, you know, and most of the fat is going to be degraded right away. It doesn't take too much time, and then you can concentrate that and put that on the first silica column, and you could scale down the silica column. That's another way uh, to do what I call uh, pre-fat digestion. Uh, and this is what we call the standard uh, situation, 135 milliliter, like 20 minutes, uh, compared to 110 for the, for the serum. Uh, that's the same picture I showed before, but again, I insist this is where you can, you can play on the size of the silica column. Um, that, that's uh, the example of what is done in, in, in the routine lab. So that's, that's the method that is uh, carried out right now, where, as I said, we use still a mixture of hexane dichloromethane. Uh, this is up to seven grams of fat. Um, and, and we do have this you know, big fat digestion. It's a manual step. So it's a, it's a glass column that, that we have. And we just quickly pack it with some acidic silica. And you just flush your sample quickly through that. Quick and dirty. It's not a fine tuning thing. It's just pre-digestion and then we go to this uh, 11 gram uh, silica. And notice that here the alumina is before the carbon. So that's the typical uh, method that is used in routine. That's the method they don't want to change in my routine lab. Um, and then we can go, as I mentioned already, to the pre-fat digestion. That's probably what uh, is kind of nice. Still using the automated system. Because right now in the routine lab, we do a manual part. We concentrate, and then we move to the power prep. What we can also do. And that's what Kara was doing. I mean, she used here two columns, but it could be only one. But we, on, we didn't have a big one in stock. So we use, let's say, a big silica column. You put that on the econoprep and use the pump to pump your, let's say, 10 gram fat diluted in hexane sample through this big column to do a pre-fat digestion in an uh, automated way. 
it's collected in the TurboVap type system, you know, and uh, you can start the evaporation while the system is running, and at the end you compress that to, let's say, 10 milliliters of hexane, and then you go to this setup. I don't know if you recognize it, but this is the serum setup. So that means that if you take that approach, you only need one type of column combination, like I would call it the serum combination. If your lipid content is small enough, you just you know, do this automated pre-fat digestion, concentrate and reload on the uh, typical serum column set, which is the one with 110 milliliters and 20 minutes. This is, of course, taking a little bit of time, but I think it's an interesting way to, to approach the, the, the problem. Uh, yeah, just Chiara compared the, the way of doing that automatically or manually. I mean, it's pro and contrast, but uh, you, you can really uh, look to that. It, it's uh, interestingly, because you could say, yeah, but why, Jeff, why do you disconnect the pre-fat digestion from the, the cleanup itself? I mean, just connect it. Don't go to the evaporator. Connect it and feed the first silica column of your set. Okay, but the more column you put in series, the higher the pressure or the back pressure is going to be in your system. So be careful of that. That's, you know, we would all, all prefer to have a fully automated things, but back pressure might be an issue because then you are going in the direction of leakage uh, and, and those things. So I really like this because even, of course, the pressure is going to be quite high there, but it's only one column. So, you know, the pump can handle that. But if you have not one, but four columns in series, it's going to be a bit more challenging. Um, yeah, that's what I said. Independently of your sample type, you can use that procedure. That's, that's the idea. So that, that's really what I like in terms of uh, let's say accreditation and so on. And it also kind of reduces the risk of cross-contamination in, in between samples. Uh, those are the numbers. Uh, this is for the, uh, the, the, the fat digestion on, on seven gram uh, fat processed. You know, we have, this is the number we have. So we are below an hour, like 50 minutes, and uh, 350 uh, milliliters, which again, it's still quite high, but because of big sample sizes. Uh, maybe the picture is not quite clear, but this is an example. As I said, Clara was using two columns for fat digestion. We could be only using one, but we didn't have at that time. You can see the colorization for you, those of you that are familiar to the port prep. We still have space there, so uh, we are sure that we have been degrading most of the fat. So a big 10 gram fat sample after that can be considered like a serum sample. That's the idea in terms of fat content. Uh, yeah, that's the, again the same type of picture. So she was just running. She, she called me in the lab. Oh, Jeff, come in the lab. Come and see. And see uh, what's happening. And then she said, oh, look, this is a seven grams fat sample. And this is a serum sample. They were running in the same time in parallel, on the same column set. And I said, no, I mean, yeah, I did the, the pre-fat digestion. And I said, oh, that's nice. So, you know, that's the proof of that. That's an evidence. Then just a few data. I mean, is the, the quality of the extract still as good as it used to be or it is for the routine lab? Because, of course, after your fraction are collected, you evaporate them, and you want them to be perfect. Because if I bring to the mass spec people a dirty extract, they're going to do that once, and the second time they're going to say, hey, stay away from me. Because I had to clean my iron source, I have to cut my GC column, and I had to realign and recalibrate. So, you know, that's the quality of the, uh, of the extract. We cannot read the numbers, but it's between 17 and 110 percent recoveries. I think there is a zoom in there. This is for TCDD, so you see the noise. Uh, that's on a real sample, I forget what it was, but uh, um, that's pork fat, that's the QC we use in the lab. So, you know, the background, the noise is, is, is okay. So, there is no differences. On the contrary, it's even a bit better compared to the routine method that, that we use. Uh, that's this one. Again, the same type of, of things for different peaks. Um, yeah, that's for tetra uh, diabetes of urine. So, this is, this is working. So, the, the first message um, that Things are moving, you know, things are changing. We really can reduce the solvent consumption. I, I believe for the serum sample, we can even go lower because six grams of acidic silica, it's probably too much. So on my wish list for next Christmas, and I'm talking to the FMS people here, I would like to have a very small version of the econoprep, like, like the size of the laptop, for example, with probably like one, maximum one gram size silica column. Same thing for alumina and even carbon could be scaled down. You're gonna have to change the format because it's gonna be difficult to manipulate. And that, that would be very nice for serum. That's on my wish list. Um, and the quality of the extract is still good. So second and, and, and last part of, of this thing, the mass spec. Uh, this is, this is the, what we do in the lab right now. So we, we have methods that, uh, we, we do have, as I said, we do fractionation. So we do have a method for PCB and we have a method for dioxin. When I say dioxin, 
include furanes and copan RPCBs. And so it's two different injection. Um, that's, that's the one for the, the PCB, that's one for the dioxin. There is like some wait time or wasted time, I could say, at the beginning. You see where I'm going, right, with the dual GC. Uh, this is, it takes 18 minutes of data acquisition for this one. And for the, uh, so that's a 25 minute time, this is HT8 for PCB. And then for the dioxin, it's about an hour, uh, and it's like a 36 minute acquisition time. But the run is 26 plus 20, because we have to wait that the compounds get out of the GC column, enter the ion source, etc., etc. Uh, so we are wasting a bit of time. So you can, you can definitely, uh, you know, for, for one sample, if you, if you want, uh, we have like 56 plus 25, so 81 minutes uh, that, that are required. Uh, and then if you use the, uh, the dual data acquisition, then you can, again, I'm not going to go in detail here, but you can basically overlap the two things. So the time you normally waste here, you can already start your dioxin run, save those 20 minutes while the PCB acquisition is, is going on. So, you know, we can save quite a significant amount of time. And the more sample you do, the more time you will be saving. But I'm, I'm sure we will have some other presentation on that. So I just wanted to uh, just, you know, quickly introduce that. But then that's what I want to talk about in terms of mass spec. I put, you know, it's not really fast because if you talk to separation science people, fast GC is like a one minute GC run. We cannot do dioxin in one minute, I'm sorry, even with the best column in the world. I would love to, but so far we cannot yet. That's a message to the thermal people, please develop a column for a one minute GC uh, dioxin measurement. But what Chiara has been trying to do is to, anyway, try to go faster. Because we're talking about, let's say, 45 minutes for dioxin, half an hour for PCB. Could this half an hour become 15 minutes? Could those 45 minutes become 25 minutes? You know, it's always good to save time. And if you do that with dual data acquisition, you really save time. Because time is, is money in, in the labs. So what she's been doing, she's been uh, trying to compress things. So she moved to a five person, 20 meter column for the dioxin and the PCB, so the, the planar fraction. Uh, still using HT8. HT8 is a very good column for PCBs. Uh, and that she used a 10 meter 0.1.1, so that's a much shorter column. Uh, and she's got for PCB like a 12 minute runtime and for, for dioxin less than 20 minutes. So that's kind of nice, but let's see how, how it, it performs. This is the, the GC run, but it's not really important. Uh, of course, you have to tell your mass spec, hey, wake up, your easy life where you were just like, oh, I'm doing a scan, boom, I'm doing a scan, boom, you know. That's, that's all time. Now you're going to have to scan, 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 scan. Because your GC peaks are going to be much narrower. Your sector instrument hates you for that, right? Because he's going to you know, move faster. But you can push it you know, a little bit more. At some point, you will say, oh, enough, I cannot do more. It's not a time of flight, right? It's a sector instrument. We have to be careful of that. But anyway, we can adjust the cycle time of the uh, data acquisition that we do. So, like this is a 40, uh, 0.42 uh, second uh, cycle time, let's say for this is the I guess the, the tetra window for the yeah, for the dioxin, TCDD, TCDF, PCB on 26. They are in the same same window. Uh, so we have to kind of reduce the time we spend on each ion. When you do that, you kind of lose in sensitivity because the, the, the shorter time you look at something, you know, the less intense will be the signal, of course, but it's a compromise. And Chiara has been trying to find a good equilibrium in there. Uh, even shorter for the, uh, in the Monorto and indicator PCB window, uh, 0.15 seconds, uh, you know, 12 milliseconds dwell time on those compounds. For the PCB, which are in higher concentration, spending 12 milliseconds to look at them is enough. Uh, for TCDD, you have to spend more time, like 50 milliseconds at least, would, would is nice. So we can adjust that based on the typical concentration that you have in your sample. You might say, how do you know the concentration in your sample? I don't know, but I know that in human serum, I, what, I know what I should expect, right? I'm, not, I'm never going to have nanogram of dioxin in the serum sample, if I don't run Yushenko sample, of course. But <laughs> so this is uh, you know, the number of scan per P across the peak. So this is for what I call a fast GC for TCDD with the 0.42 second cycle time. Remember, the dwell time is 60 milliseconds. But even if the, the peak are narrower, uh, this is like the peak width at the base here is like seven seconds. And in the normal method, it was like, let's say, the double. So we kind of cut by a factor of two the peak width at the base for those compounds. So we could accommodate that by speed, speeding up a little bit the sector. But um, you know that that's still okay. That's enough scan across the peak to make good uh, characterization of the peak. Um, but then, of course, the big question is that yes, you go faster on the GC. You have 
a lot of analytes that I've seen through NPCP, how do you, are you sure that you are not creating new co-illusion? Because all those compounds, as we know, have different toxic equivalent factors. So if I now start to tell in my report to my customer, oh, by the way, this is tetra dioxin furans. That's tetra, but they don't have the same TF, so they have to be separated, right? And uh, again, QAQC on the EU legislation is quite strict. It tells you exactly how much separation you have to have in between the different compounds. So I I'm just showing you a few slides about to, sh to convince you that the separation is still there on those uh, analyses. This is for, that's, that's a possible, that's a potential issue to have uh, interference between the ion of labeled uh, TCDF and native TCDD. Uh, that's especially the peak there, so that's to show you. Uh, if we do have about like the same concentration, that's not a big deal, but if the concentration between the C13 TCDF and the native TCD is very different, if, you know, that can become an issue because you have a huge signal of the interfering ion of the C13 that will be interfering with your tiny signal of the native TCDD. And TCDD is always at low level, so we have to be careful. But we, we, we did some tests on, on a, a QAQC sample and there is no uh, significant interference on, on that side. Uh, you know, because they, they, they are still separated. The distance between those two peaks is still, you know, big enough to avoid any uh, cross-contamination, if I can say it like this. We have to check also for the separation of the uh, hexafurane and hexadioxine. There are, again, uh, guidelines in the EU legislation. We are, uh, you know, okay with those guidelines for this, those hexa compound. Uh, for the pentane and the possible interferences or, you know, coelution with PCB169, uh, again, that's okay in terms of, of ions. That's closer here, but no problem with the with the ions. Um, yeah, that's with PCB one twenty six, PCB seventy seven eighty one. That's no big deal. They are alone somewhere in the chromatogram, so they are not close to anything else. PCB twenty eight could be an issue with thirty one, depending on the type of samples, but it's it's not. They are uh, separated. One twenty three, one eighteen. So remember, this is on the HT eight type of uh, stationary phase. Uh, that's a carborean type phase. Uh, we have good separation between 118 and uh, 123. That's not an issue. 160 to 138, that's the, the other big deal. That could be a big deal if you don't get them separated properly, but they are, they are separated. Uh, 156, 157, I'm not going to show all you the chromatogram, but you just I think you understand that we have good separation. What do we gain? Okay, we, have, we go faster, so we save time. But there is also one thing, and that's the origin of this work, because I've been present, talking about cryogenic zone compression in the past, you know, and you know how, how much I love it. Uh, but unfortunately, we have not been able to, to, to produce some more data in the, the last few months. But the idea was also going for fast GC to revisit some of the work that was previously, previously done at Thermo to try to compress the peak, not using cryogenic compression, but just going faster. You go for fast GC, the peak is narrower, so it's higher. Mass conservation, right? So we are expecting a gain in sensitivity even though you know, the time we spent on the ion with the mass spec is a bit different. But this is, you know, the gain is there. I mean, we have like about 70% enhancement of the signal by going faster. Um, this is 0.7 picogram, this is 2 picogram, but if you just normalize that, this is how we get the, the 70%. Um, and this is, yeah, that's uh, 19 femtogram, a signal of uh, 19 femtogram in a real sample for TCDD. So you've got very nice in antinose ratio of above 200 there. So we gain a little bit. Uh, I'm not transforming a you know, femtogram type sensitivity to a you know, low atogram, not yet. But it's going in that direction. Um, this is the calibration. We are starting to calibrate that. It's not validated yet, so it will be soon, but we are just in the, in the process. So that, that's where we are now. So it's promising. I, I hope we can maybe have a fully validated method, but since my routine lab is never <laughs> interested in any new method, I'm not dreaming that they're going to use it, but maybe some of you can be interested in, in, in the method. Um, and especially, uh, again, the major coalition issues are not uh, a problem. So I would say this has to continue, and you know, this is like the back to the future thing, back to the meeting in, in August, if you remember. So this is you know, still moving, so hopefully we will have more data to show in the next pop meeting uh, in a couple of years. So that's all I wanted to say. So thanks for your attention.